coming up. Dylan's going to be presenting on that, so please welcome him to the stage. Uh, thank you for the kind intro. Um, so my name's Dylan. Um, I'm relatively new to giving talks at cons, and I'm also new to core camp. So when a friend of mine invited me to go to a hacker conference in the middle of the woods, I submitted a rather traditional uh, talk. And after kind of thumbing through some of the other talks, I'm not quite sure if I got the motif perfect. So I apologize. There won't be any creme brulee at this talk. Um, I'll work on that for next time, though. Um, I made a tool, and I'm trying to give it back to the community and share it with folks. And that's basically what the talk's on. Um, so with that said, um, yeah, so, so like about a year and a half ago, um, I was struggling with this problem um, of basically secrets uh, being committed to source code, secrets being passwords, API tokens, things like that. Um, it was something that a lot of developers I was working with were struggling with. So I'm an application security engineer, and I tend to work closely with developers. Um, but it's also a problem that I myself have been guilty of in the past. Um, so I wanted to just make a tool to basically be able to identify or quickly flag these secrets so that they don't get buried in a mountain of source code. Um, and so um, that kind of begs the question of like, why is it bad to have the secrets in the source code in the first place? Um, I'll list a couple of reasons here, but really, like. There's, there's a lot of, of reasons. Um, these secrets can often lead to really bad problems, and you want to be really careful and sensitive where you lock them up. Um, they can definitely lead to breaches. They can help with lateral movement. If you've infected one host and you find the source code on that host and there's secrets in it, you can move laterally to another host. You can elevate privilege. If you have a particular permission set on one machine, you get easy access to secrets. You can move up to root or move to another system um, with elevated privileges. Um, workstations get lost all the time. People's laptops get left on trains. Um, if you don't have full disk encryption um, and your secrets are just lying around in source code on the, on the hard drive, um, even if you revoke access to the, to, the, to the workstation, there could be other secrets in there that you, that you have to, to worry about. Um, and really the last bullet point here is one that I'm most worried about. Um, source code is like really leaky. Um, even if you try to keep it like really locked down, um, ultimately, in, in some capacity, some of your source code is going to end up on the internet. Um, whether that's an insider that intentionally posts it, an insider for convenience that's just temporarily posting it over pastebin, um, or uh, you accidentally expose a .git directory. Um, you, you know, if, if you uh, spend some time on an AppSec team, you know that like give it enough time, um, it, it, it happens. And if you've got API keys and tokens in that source code, um, you're basically giving um, an attacker access to, to systems um, directly after they get that source code. Um, so I have some public examples of um, when this has, has, has been a problem that I can speak to. And then I have a lot more um, non-public examples that I've reported through bug bounties and such that follow the same motif. Um, so, so this one uh, is a, a pretty esteemed uh, security engineer at HackerOne, um, Reed. He's involved in the local security community in San Francisco. Uh, basically, a security researcher came in and was like, you know, I went through your personal GitHub repository and I found an API access token on your, uh, on your GitHub. And he submitted that to uh, HackerOne's HackerOne program. Um, and Reed was really cool about it. He paid out the researcher two grand and uh, ended up making that issue public so that we can bring some visibility to the problem. Um, but it kind of helps illustrate how leaky these things can be, where this was like a, a personal GitHub and a personal account, but it happened to have like an environment variable or a, a, an AWS token that was related to HackerOne. Um, this is a, a little bit more of a, a, a public example, um, but basically um, some researcher went through um, GitHub searching for Slack API access tokens and found more than 1,500 live tokens. Um, and if you imagine Slack, that's another place where people potentially put secrets and passwords. So if somebody posted an access token to their personal GitHub for a work account for like a bot they're working on or something like that, or 
maybe something was open source with a Slack token, an attacker could use that to dump Slack history and potentially get more keys and move laterally further from there. Um, and then this is, you know, again, stepping it up a little further. Um, these are AWS tokens that were committed to GitHub. Here, a malicious actor stole these AWS tokens and used them to mine um, Bitcoin, which ran up a bill of over $2,000, um, which is uh, kind of funny, but also kind of sad. Um, but also, like, if, if you work AppSec, this is, this is all really familiar. Like, devs commit AWS tokens all the time. Stuff gets open sourced. Um, AWS tokens end up um, in places that they shouldn't. Um, and then last, probably the most notable example that we're all familiar with, um, the, the time that Uber accidentally committed an AWS token to uh, public GitHub and a researcher um, found it and then maybe blackmailed them for $100,000. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the details on that are a little fuzzy. <laughs> but uh, it definitely made national news and the the Uber CISO went and talked to front of Congress about it. It was, you know, it's a big deal for, a, you know, a dev accidentally pushing an AWS token, um, which is again a really systemic common problem we're all familiar with. Um, so th this is not a talk at all on how you should manage your secrets. There are a ton of answers to that and a ton of tools for that. Um, I have a couple examples up on the board, but that's completely dependent on your environment. Um, Pick the secrets management solution that is best for, for you and for your environment. Um, this, this is more of just a talk of getting those secrets out of your source code. Um, so here you see the, the secrets management solution is like the, the fence and then truffle hog is the border collie up there in the top left corner herding the secrets into the secrets management solution. Um, it's, it's designed to identify uh, secrets and get them moved into your secrets management solution. Um, so um, the interesting thing here, like before I mentioned a couple of different ways that source code can get leaked, it, it seems like source code lives in one place, right? It lives in version control. But when you stop to think about it, like we paste source code all over the place, right? It, it lives in package managers. Um, your mobile applications, every app you download, you're downloading the whole source code of that app. We paste snippets of source code in Slack. Um, when you go to a website, you download, you know, tremendous amount of JavaScript and HTML. Um, and then um, on the bottom there, revision history. So not just the current incarnation of your version control, but also the past incarnations of your version of your source code. All of these places are places that. I and other researchers have identified secrets have, have leaked. It's kind of just like a law of large numbers. If you have a, if you have a, a, a large enough volume of source code um, somewhere in there, secrets are, are going to make their way in. Um, AWS tokens, um, it, it sounds crazy. Like who would package an AWS token in an APK mobile app and then put it on the public um, Google Play Store? But sure enough, um, it's, it happens. Um, so, uh, you know, highlighting that last point there, this is a pretty standard GitHub repository. It's actually the Facebook React one. And on the top, this green, is all the source code that was added to the project. But the red is kind of what I'm more interested in. That's where source code was taken away from the project. So as time goes on, people are changing features. They're adding new code, but they're also taking code away. But if you go to Facebook's React repository online, all that code they took away is still there. It's just buried in the version control, um, which for any other vulnerability isn't a problem because you bury a cross-site scripting in the past. Nobody's going to dig it up and become vulnerable to cross-site scripting. But if you bury a secret in the past and that secret is live, <laughs> um, you can still use it. Um, and so that, that to me, was, was a problem. Like we, we could come up with some regexes and greps to find the secrets in the current incarnation of the source code, but there's an equal amount, if not more, red in the past source code that we're just completely ignoring if we take that approach. Um, and so this, this is a, an, ex, an example of, of something that I pulled up recently, but you can run the search today and it'll be the same thing. Um, if you search removed password in GitHub, you'll just find. Um, <laughs> In this particular instance, this is um, 300,000 results 
of commits of people accidentally committing a password and then the next commit committing over the top, uh, pulling that source code out of the current incarnation. Um, but again, you can just click these links and get access to that token. Um, hopefully they changed, everyone changed their password at the same time. Right, hopefully they changed the password. Um, ideally, they would have nuked that commit entirely as well. Um, but uh, they, they didn't end up nuking the password. Uh, and it's a game of law of large numbers. Like if you evangelicalize that you need to rotate your password, given enough devs, at least one of them won't. And because it's really easy to run these searches and automate a tool to just go through and check which ones are live, um, a lot of them are going to be live. Force pushing, right? Your, your, your everyone's commit, or everyone's working copy. Yeah, well. And it can be a nightmare, especially if you have a lot of different skill levels. Yeah, well, that's another good point. I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, this is a hard problem. Um, it really is. But um, yeah, so this, this is. Um, Again, just sort of highlighting the scope and depth of this problem. And again, if you run through these, you'll find some that are live, and you'll find some that point to some pretty notable companies. Um, so, so some reasons why um, you may have commits like this. Um, a, a developer may have, um, like I mentioned before, removed it by mistake. Um, or like an entire feature may have been removed. Maybe you were using AWS um, SQS offering for storing large blobs of text, and at some point you decided you wanted to switch to S3. So you delete a large swath of source code, which includes an AWS token you're using for SQS, and you replace it with an S3 source code token. Um, maybe we catch the S3 one when we do our source code review, but you're not going to carry that catch that SQS one that's buried. Um, and, and more often than not, they end up still being live. Uh, and the last one here is kind of a funny one that I've encountered a lot. Um, Basically, you know, right before you go to open source something at a company, typically you'll have like a whole approval process, like legal, security, you'll have to sign off on it. There'll be like an open source software review that the security team will quickly do, just a prick cursory that they'll go through, look for any obvious vulnerabilities, look for secrets in the source code. Well, right before that review, the developers are going to want to clean it up because they know it's not in a perfect state. And so they'll go through and they'll just remove secrets and make it look better to try to get it through on the first try. Um, but often they don't purge it from the history. They don't rotate those credentials. Um, and so it's kind of ironic. They go th in going through the source code review, the action that they do to clean themselves up um, makes it such that the security engineer doing the review often doesn't catch the, the hidden secret because they're only looking at the most recent incarnation of the code. Um, so this is an example of like, um, basically when I first when I first got the the, the tool um, and I ran it, um, I found this AWS uh, token in one of Netflix's repositories, and I got their permission ahead of time for using this slide. Um, but basically, this is one of many companies where I found these tokens buried. Some of them live. Um, this one gave me permission. Some didn't. Um, and then this one was buried in an old incarnation, um, but not in the current version of the code. Um, and that's still there, by the way. They rotated the cred, but they didn't pull, uh, they, they didn't pull the access token, probably worried about breaking um, force push and all that. So um, you can still view this. It's in a buried commit. Um, so we, we, have to have this, we have to solve this problem of being able to scan old commits. Um, and we can't run grep on the .git directory because I'm not an expert in the git um, protocol, but the way these binary blobs are stored, um, a dumb grep doesn't work on them. Um, right, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, long story short, this was the problem that I was trying to solve of like, we, we need to go back and, and find these keys um, and so truffle hog was the, the solution that I came up with that. Um, and what's, uh, what's, what's kind of interesting is I, I actually didn't spike on doing regexes initially. I'll get more on that later, but I ended up adding regexes. Um, so, so what is truffle hog? It's, it's an open source tool that specifically stands Git repositories, um, doesn't currently have SVN or, or any other support. Um, goes all the way through all the old revision history. It searches every branch. Um, and it's, it just looks for, for secrets. Um, I made it as like a security audit tool, um, but I've tried to pivot that lately to make it more of a DevOps tool, to switch it to more of a proactive flow rather than a reactive flow, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. 
Um, so, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I, I didn't build this out with regexes initially because I didn't want to have to write a regex for every secret on the planet, which later I realized I had to do. <laughs> um, but um, initially, I just I just look for high sources of entropy. Um, it, more often than not, um, if it flags on a high source of entropy, it is a, a secret or a key. Um, this this won't get everything. It won't get low low entropy uh, passwords, for example, um, and it will false positive a lot. So you'll get things like URLs, YouTube URLs, and stuff like that flagging. Um, but if you're just doing like a one-time open source review or like a pen test, or you're using this for offensive security, um, it 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 works really well on entropy mode. Um, but if you want to automate this and stick it in a DevOps pipeline and deliver these results to a developer, it's probably too much noise, um, is, is what I found. Um, so like I mentioned before, like it's, it's, it's great for pen tests, great for doing like a one-time open source review, um, really good for bug bounties. Use Truffle Hog on every company you can imagine. You'll probably make some loot out of it. Um, I, before open sourcing it, I, I definitely ran it on some big companies and did that. Um, <laughs> But, but the cons are, like I mentioned before, like you can't stick this in a DevOps pipeline without it flaring on a ton of false positives. There's an example in the same Netflix uh, repository where it flagged on a false positive. That's a, a URL that just has a lot of entropy in it. It's got a commit hash. And the entropy there is, is interesting because it's a 32-character text string, which is the exact same entropy source that, say, a, a Facebook access token is. It's also a 32-character hex string. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of false positives with this approach. It doesn't scale well. It's not very good with, with uh, reactive. It's, it's pretty good with proactive. Um, or I, I said that backwards, but... Um, so, I, you know, I, eventually I caved. And I was like, all right, I gotta just write some, some regular expressions for, like, the really sensitive stuff. Um, and, and so I built out the, the, the regex flag in Travel Hog. Um, and so that, that's what this is. So basically, I, I added explicit checks for RSA tokens, for AWS tokens, for Slack tokens, um, for um, a bunch of different really common um, tokens that people commit to repositories. And I made it extensible so that you could run your own rules. Um, it, it's better for catching low entropy stuff. If you've got a password that you know people are committing a ton of times, you could write a regex around that particular password structure or around the um, particular topology of the source code that usually introduces the password. It, it scales a lot better. Um, it reduces the noise if you turn off the entropy mode and you just rely on the regex mode. And you can customize it for your environment, um, which, which just makes it a lot better for putting in DevOps pipelines. Um, there's a question in the front row here. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. The question was basically, is, is, there, um, is there a way to run this before you even do the commit? Um, and uh, is, is there a way to reject commits if it looks like there's credentials? Um, I, I have built out similar things. And I'm going to talk about how, how you can build out things like that. But there's a lot of pitfalls that go with that approach. And trying to block on things that look like secrets, if you haven't actually verified them, um, more often than not becomes a huge blocker because things like URLs and stuff like that will flag up. Um, so I'll talk about how we kind of address that um, in a bit. Um, but one of the big disadvantages of the regex mode is you miss types of keys that you don't know about. So if they're using a Twilio off key and you don't have a regex for Twilio, um, you'll just completely miss that in this approach. And it, it still does require some manual triage out of the box. Um, like I said, sometimes even with these regexes, there'll be some false positives. And Oh, more often than not, a lot of these keys will have been rolled, but often they're live. Um, and figuring out which is which requires some manual trash. Um, so this is kind of the initial pipeline that I had imagined. You have an incoming git commit hook. Travel hog runs on the git commit hook. And then you have to have some sort of triage process. And that triage process I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. But that, at this stage, has to be a little bit manual. Somebody will have to go in, figure out whether or not that token is live, figure out the right approach on how they rotate it, figure out whether or not they want to block this commit or whether or not it was a false positive. Um, and then you have to remediate. You have to um, move that secret out of the source code. You have to rotate that secret. Um, you have to handle the, the incident appropriately, figure out whether or not you want to purge it from, from commit history. Um, 
So, um, uh, like we talked about before, it can be a little tricky to, if, if, you, if you purge it from commit history um, with a tool like uh, BFG Repo Cleaner, which is a really nice tool for doing that. It, it'll go through and modify your history so that it removes that token. You end up with problems where you're out of sync with all of your coworkers, so they'll try to do a poll and all of a sudden their history isn't the same as your history and you get all kinds of merge issues. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, I, I don't have a good solution for addressing that. I, I do recommend purging it from the history. That way, tools like Trufflehog don't false positive all the time with the rotated token. Um, but it, it isn't a perfect solution. It does lead to some pain points. Um, you should definitely rotate the secret um, because after you pulled it out, like I said before, there's so many other places source code ends up. Um, you don't know where else that secret is. It, it, it could be in Pastebin. It could be in Slack. Um, and then you're going to want to keep track of all the secrets that you've pulled out of source code just to enforce that they've been rotated. So you'll need some sort of key value store for that. Um, yeah, another question? For yeah, that's a really good point. Um, the, the, the point raised is basically if we're creating a centralized store of all the sensitive secrets in the company, like that's, it, it's, it's in itself introducing a kind of a single point of failure. Um, and that's, that's totally a good, uh, a good point. Um, these secrets were in Git, and anybody could have ran Trufflehog to extract them. Um, but putting them in a single central, single point of failure makes it a little bit easier. Um, and that's, you know, uh, it's a hard problem, um, definitely. So basically, um, yeah, one more question. Yeah, so the question is, like, why take it out of the repo if you're rolling it? And my answer for that is basically um, if you run a, another tool like Trufflehog or like a static analysis tool, it'll flag up as a false positive in the future. Um, and we, we want to minif minify that, basically. Um, looks like there's another question. Can we kind of hold the we can, yeah, we can talk about it uh, when I get through the slides, basically. Um, I'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, but uh, if you remember earlier, like I talked about all these other places that, that secrets end up, like not just source code. Um, and basically, uh, this tool only addresses one of those secrets. And so recently, I spiked on another one of those places that source code lives. Um, and that place is package managers. And the two that I put my main focus on was NPM and PyPy, which is Node.js's package manager and Python's package manager. Um, so what's interesting about these is basically when you package a package to NPM or PyPy, it doesn't pull from your Git source code. It doesn't know what Git is. It pulls from your file system. It, it, in the case of NPM, I think it pays attention to your .gitignore file. Um, but if you had a, a testing script that had a secret in it that you didn't commit to source code and then you just package it up and sent it to NPM or to PyPy, that testing script will end up in NPM and PyPy um, with your secret. And then people will pull down your package and they'll run them locally and not know that that secret is there and you've replicated this AWS token distributed across hundreds of people running your open source package. Um, and what's worse is like, again, when you do this open source uh, review, They'll review the, the security teams will review the Git code. They probably won't pull down the package and, and review that. Um, and similar to source code, um, package managers have history. They have versions. Um, and each of those versions can have their own keys. So an older version can have a key that a future version doesn't have. But that, ver that version can stay up, and that key can stay live. And somebody can go in and find it later. Um, so. Basically, what I found from experimenting is if you publish to, AD, AD, or, uh, to NPM or to PyPy and the description of your package contains the string AWS anywhere in it, um, there is a 2% chance that your package will have a live AWS token in it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I talked about one of the reasons testing scripts. Another reason is you may have an environment variable sourcing script in that same um, repository that you, you just source when you run your code. Um, and so when you do your packaging to NPM or PyPy, you may accidentally package up that environmental variable script, even though it never ended up in version control. 
Um, and then the last version here, er, the last reason here is like experimental code. When I do experimental code, again, I struggle with the same problem. I, I put secrets temporarily in the source code and then pull them out later. Um, well, you may think, well, that experimental code isn't tracked in my current version of Git. And then you may package a new version um, to NPM or to PyPy, um, thinking that only the current version of your, your Git is what's getting packaged. But actually, the experimental code also gets packaged and your, your secret gets sent up. Um, <coughs> So I'm, I'm introducing this new tool, and I'll, I'll just full disclosure ahead of time, this is like a really dumb name that I gave it. <laughs> um, my, the, the, the thinking was basically like it's, it's you, you got packages, so it's Santa, it's Santa going, going through packages, and for consistency, there's the hog at the end. It, it, didn't, it didn't make sense, but, <laughs> but basically uh, what Santa hog does is, <laughs> that's, that's true, it does have a, a very memorable name. What Sandhog does is it, it goes through NPM and PyPy specifically. And you may be thinking, what about all the other package managers? Um, yeah, I just didn't spike on those, but I, I know for a fact they have secrets in them as well. Um, I, I don't have a tool for them, but any other package manager you think of probably has the same problem. Um, and, it, and it runs the same entropy regex checks that Treblehog does on NPM and Python packages. Um, it's open source, and it's, it's on my GitHub. Um, and so I have... Uh, a sample here of it running. It doesn't have quite as pretty of an output as um, as Treblehog does currently, but here I ran it on a, uh, on an Uber um, package, and you can you can see it's flagged on an AWS token. It flagged on a bunch of private keys. Um, but what's interesting here is if you actually dig into it a little bit, and you look at that full path for the token, um, it, it falls in a directory called Node Modules. And if you know anything about Node.js, the Node Modules directory is where all of your packages dependencies live. And in some of these paths, there's many different layers of node modules. This basically means these keys are dependencies of dependencies of dependencies. So Uber went to package this package, and they accidentally packaged up their node modules um, instead of allowing that to get installed when you pulled down their package. Um, and one of the dependencies that Uber used happened to have a token in it that had nothing to do with Uber. It was just some random person that open sourced this thing. And then Uber ended up packaging that dependency and then sharing that random stranger's AWS token in their package. Um, so you know, it kind of just goes back to like the, the source code is leaky. And even if this random stranger on the internet ended up removing that token from their version of the package, Uber has already repackaged it and put it in their package. Um, and it, it's propagated and replicated across hundreds of people's machines at this point. Um, so here's my revised DevOps pipeline. Um, basically, the inputs to the triage are different depending on what you're scanning. And I have two things here that I'm scanning, Git and, and um, and package managers, but you can imagine building out a scanner for Slack or for G Suite or for anywhere else you may be worried about source code or, or secrets ending up. Um, and then that just funnels into the same triage step. None of that's going to change. Somebody still has to verify whether or not that token is live. And then the same remediation step of rotating that token. Um, so um, basically, I've open sourced these tools, and I'm kind of a one man show. I've had a lot of awesome people submit pull requests. Um, some of them I've been able to service quicker than others. Um, it's kind of backed up recently because I've been working on a lot of talks and stuff like that. But I could definitely use help from the community. Um, I do get to pull requests eventually, and there's more features that I want to add. I could definitely improve the regexes and add more. Um, I'd like to be able to improve its ability to scan a range of commits. Currently, it clones the whole um, Git source code, and then it does the scan on a range. But it'd be nice if it only fetched the subsection um, just to improve in performance. Uh, currently, it's not multi-threaded, single-threaded. Um, all this stuff that I could use community help for, um, and then lots more features that I can't even think of. Um, it's, it's on my GitHub, but again, like, feel free to drop me a message ahead of time if you've got a feature you're thinking about and you want to work on. We can collaborate. Um, and then I pulled those regexes out because I know people are going to be building other tools like uh, Slack integrations or whatever else you want to run these regexes on. Um, so those are available in a separate repo now and in just a JSON file that you can, um, you can import for your own needs. Um, 
So the last step here that I want to highlight, um, we talked about the triage step, and the really gross part is it's manual. Like nobody wants to manually go through a pile of false positives. Um, that's a that's a really gross job that people would get fed up with and, and quit if like that was their full time job. Um, and so like you may be thinking like we can automate this, right? Like I've had that thought a lot of times, um, and I've actually built out automators in the past of like if you know it's an AWS token or it looks and smells like an AWS token, just test it against AWS. See whether or not AWS returns back, yes, this is a true token. And then you can automate the triage. You don't even need a human to come in and, and see whether or not that token is a, is a true positive or a live token. You just completely automate it. Um, well, so this is an example uh, verifier that does just that. It takes in a token tries to do a, a, an a SES call with the AWS token and then just returns true or false for whether or not that token is there. Um, it's really nice, but there are some drawbacks to that approach. Um, I'll start by saying I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, but if you, if you think about that Uber example, like Uber packaged a sub-dependency of a sub-dependency that included a token from some stranger that built this package in some weird part of the planet um, Uber had nothing to do with that. So let's say Uber built a system that automatically triaged whether or not tokens were flying through their DevOps pipeline. And let's say it ran on every package before they packaged it to NPM or PyPy. What would end up happening in that case is they would end up pulling down this random stranger's token and offing against AWS with it. And because that stranger hasn't given you consent or permission to do that, um, you're probably violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. You're probably authenticating to a system that you don't have access to. Um, so you have to be really careful with this approach. Um, rogue keys can appear in your source code that didn't come from your environment. Um, and you probably shouldn't use this approach for bug bounties for the same reason. Like, y most time bug bounties will set up, you know, rules that are like, you're not allowed to move laterally, or like, if you've gained access to this system, stop testing. Um, and so if you set up this automatic verifier system where you're pulling down their tokens and offing with it, um, number one, you're gonna give them a big scare because they're gonna see that that token was actually used by a random stranger on the internet. Um, but number two, they probably didn't give you permission, you're probably breaking the CFAA if you do that. Um, so I'm not saying you can't use auto verifiers, I'm just not a lawyer and I'm not gonna, um, it's, it, there, there's some interesting components to that. Um, and then uh, before I mentioned, like, there are all these other things that I didn't build scanners for. Fortunately, some folks on the internet have built them for some of these applications. So this is a really nice tool um, that some folks may have used before. You put in an Android package name there, and it'll just scan for secrets. Um, but again, like, systemic problem with people packaging secrets in source code. Um, and in the Android store, um, you can get AWS tokens and other gnarly secrets from um, folks that have packaged um, and, and Android apps to that, the public Play Store. Um, so this is a link to all the things I talked about. Um, Truffle the most popular one, Santa Hog, the relatively new one, and then just the standalone regexes if you just want to write your own um, infrastructure for Slack or, or whatever else. Um, and that's, that's basically uh, all I have. But uh, I know there were some questions, so I want to open it up to, to Q&A if we still have them. <coughs> still have some questions. Yes? Real quick question about the AWS token. Um, does AWS have APIs where you can check to see if the token is, they will check to see if the token is valid even if it wouldn't be authorized to perform an action? Um, so what's STS? Yeah, so let me go back to the specific call. The question was whether or not AWS has a, uh, has a, an endpoint that allows you to basically, without performing any state changing action, see whether or not the token is live. This SDS token will just tell you the identity of the token. It'll tell you which AWS account it's associated with. It's relatively non-destructive, but it does return information um, that is potentially privileged information, like the AWS account it's associated with. Um, and you bring up a, a, really another point that I, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but like, not every um, API has a nice, friendly API endpoint that you can hit that tells you whether or not the token is live. And some of them, depending on the scope you give that, ADA, that, that token, it's not really easy to, to test whether or not that token is live 
without trying a, a suite of endpoints. Because if it's only scoped to these endpoints, and you don't know what scope the token is, has, you, you have to kind of test its scope. And it's, it's, it's kind of messy and requires multiple requests. Um, but yeah, it'd be really nice if, if people building APIs built an endpoint specifically designed to see whether or not the token was live, and built in terms and conditions saying we allow strangers on the internet to, to hit this endpoint. Um, but that isn't a feature that I've seen anybody build. Um, yes, question. So it seems like it's somewhat common that developers are committing over secrets as opposed to rewriting history and rectifying mistakes. Yeah. How much of that is a human problem and not a technical yeah, so the question was basically um, developers are commonly pushing over the top of these secrets and they're not like rotating them and they're not like rectifying the problem. They're just kind of burying it. Is, is that more of like a, a human problem that maybe you can fix with like training or something like that as opposed to like a, a technical problem that we can solve with a, with a tool? I'm kind of of the approach like I'm, I'm an engineer and maybe this is a bias, but I'm kind of of the approach that like if you have a human problem like no amount of training is ever going to completely get rid of it. Like law of large numbers, you'll always have some percentage of your engineers doing this mistake. And that's kind of where I try to supplement that gap with technical tools. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think most people don't want to admit if they messed up. And like if you, force, if you have to force push, you got to talk to everybody and tell people you messed up. And that's where the problem is. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, basically, she said like, uh, th this could come out of like almost embarrassment of like if you if you push something and, and you want to commit over the top of it, but you don't want to have to deal with merge conflicts. It's just kind of a, a quiet way to make this go away without anyone noticing. Um, and and that, that's a good point. Um, and I think like our technical solutions should should be accommodating of that in some in some capacity. Um, yes. Well, maybe instead of testing the tool here, like as you test the key, you instead have, as part of your CI checks, yeah. anything that says, hey, this is an issue, right. you need someone from the ops team to sign off on this is not an issue. If it's retroactive, it's always going to be contentious. So sure. the point of this is to, is to put uh, automated checks in place so that it's never retroactive, right. yeah. ideally. Some, something yeah. that is so call it out as soon as possible. Yeah. So one, yeah, one possible solution is to have this as like a, a pre-commit hook or to build it into the IDE so that it doesn't even make it into version control in the first place. Um, yes, question. Um, who's that? Question. So I, I was going to add to that. It's, it's also easy to, you know, to, to try to roll this into your DevOps pipeline when you have one DevOps pipeline, but when you have like 30 different dev teams, or who knows how many dev teams with who knows how many different CI CD pipelines, yeah. it becomes a lot more difficult. Yeah, so like detection, detection. You have to take responsibility for security. Dev teams need to. Dev teams need to do ops. I agree with that. Yeah, like the, but the first step yeah, is this is part of your policy, and then you try to roll that out to the automation of all the pipelines. Yeah. Right. So this is a way of holding people accountable. Right? And yeah. you just first you got to do the policies, let them know that you're going to hold them accountable to this. Yeah. And then you give them a way to get visibility into that, so they can see that they're fucking up. And then you come back and you say, hey, by the way, did you know you fucked up? And they're like, yeah, I totally saw this in my tooling that you gave me. Thank you. Uh, we're going to fix it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think like more on that, like if you're first rolling something like this out, you want to be super light touch. <laughs> If you like aggressively go in with hard blockers and stuff like that, you're going to end up with a lot of unhappy developers and breaking production more often than not. Um, yeah, question in the front. I would, I mean, I would just add to that. Um, I, I, I'm a developer and I am bad at ops. I am terrible at ops. And you should not rely on developers to do ops. Right, right. I said that and I immediately regretted it. <laughs> 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 so then here's a great tool to help you exactly. do a better job at this stuff. And I would love that tool and I want to be told when I'm doing yes. yeah, right. Question, 
I think one of the things that's important, like they mentioned, that there's lots of CI pipelines. Yeah. Let's face it, if you work in security, there's one of you for every 150 developers. Yeah. And so one of the things that I've been trying to work on is to develop a integratable yeah. pipeline from for the security team, where it's like, okay, here's a step that you add in your tank in the pipeline. It's non-blocking. But as soon as your pipeline it's triggers, there's ours to look for things too. Yeah. Because otherwise, oh. like, you know, and then you still have to police that every time a new Jenkins <laughs> comes up, you know, yeah. and here we go. So, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not confident enough to say this with 100%, but I'm almost of the philosophy that, like, if, if you start building out an AppSec team before you have a good op, ops pipeline, ops story, um, it's just like, what are, what are you doing? It's like, you're, you're just, like, adding issues to, you know, when, when there's more systemic problems that should be addressed first, I think. Yeah, that's true. That's also true. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's really a hard problem. Right. Question in the back. Uh, just a comment on the accountability of the uh, example you used for the Uber employee uh, pushing AWS tokens to GitHub, that person got fired. Yeah. Yeah, I would not have fired that engineer if I were her. That's the difference between a culture of blame and a culture of actual accountability. Well, not only that. I mean, the other thing is, like, I don't know how much we know about that whole situation, but that particular engineer, that may not have been their first look up. So, you know, they, they could have been fired. That may have just been the I don't want to pass judgment. Yeah, but actually, your point is excellent. There's a whole spectrum of accountability, right? And there's also a whole spectrum. Yeah. So uh, an engineering solution is just a step in making sure that you have something in place to allow an engineer to be accepted. Like, uh, this, this doesn't have yeah. a cultural problem. It's a piece of the puzzle. Cool. Any more questions? Yep. I'm wondering how pluggable the language support for Santa Hog is. Yeah, so right now what Santa Hog is, is basically it will pull down um, the regexes that I have abstracted out of Trufflehog, and then it just runs those dumb regexes on the unzipped versions of your NPM and your PyPy package. And it hard codes the NPM and PyPy hosts. I should abstract that out so you can run them on internal NPM and PyPy standups, but it's not extensible in the fact that like you couldn't easily have it scan, um, a, yeah, exactly, an another package manager. You'd have to build out API calls for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wondered whether or not I should spike on like Maven or something like that. And I, I just decided because it was um, like there, there was some kind of compilation step there. I, I decided not to start with that. Just start with situations that just have raw source code being uploaded. Um, but yeah, all those things should be explored. and. Somebody should should help me build that stuff out. Definitely. Um, uh, I think. Did, did you have a your hand up or your hat? Uh, I think in the rear and then the front. Um, what's happening? Oh, so this is a fantastic. Talk. Thanks. Thank you so much. And those two are amazing. Thank you. And uh, even the red alone are probably super happy. And you did a really great job. With this. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. Is it really easy to find your stuff so that people can contribute? Yeah, so actually, I apologize to every hog farmer out there. Because if you Google truffle hog on the front page of Google, you get this tool. <laughs> so for all those poor people looking for hog slop and end up with this weird tech stuff, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, truffle, truffle hog's pretty easy to find. If you want to find Santa hog and all the other stuff, um, once you find Triple Hog, they're all under my username. Um, and then the links are uh, at the end. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Uh, unallocated storage in public ALIs. Yeah. Yeah, or uh, open S3 buckets is another one. Um, somebody once told me about a tool that will like recursively go to an, S an open S3 bucket and then find tokens for more S3 buckets. And then off to those, look for more tokens, and then just. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Schmuck on top from 2012. Nice. Yes, that, that supposedly works. So, yeah, lateral movement <laughs> in the cloud. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you, everyone.